typically a pretty open book with your career. What are some of the, the things you regret about your career, mistakes, things you wish you would have done differently, perhaps? Well, now that I've wised up to the benefits of economic freedom, I regret much of my first 20 years of bashing business, of calling for more regulation because of this problem. And that's the intuitive reaction. You send the TV out to 15 repair shops. Some people cheat you. Politicians call me up and say, oh, great piece. We're going to a, establish a Department of Consumer Affairs and license TV repair shops and car repair shops. And if you if you're haven't read Reason Magazine, it sounds good because you like licensing. We license dogs and drivers. It just sounds like the right thing to do. And I encouraged that sort of thing for many years, so I regret much of that. I did scare stories, danger in the grass, lawn chemicals that were over the top. And I've, I was worried about exploding coffee pots throughout my whole childhood because of you. <laughs> I did a story on somebody who died because their house caught fire because their coffee pot blew up. And you know, these things do happen, but it's a big country, a lot of nasty stuff happening to people. You got 50 people who die every year from plastic bags, so. Well, they're banning those too, so you don't have to worry about that. What, what about the flip side, the, the things that you look back and you're truly proud of what you've done? What are your greatest accomplishments? My first was this show called Are We Scaring Ourselves to Death? That finally, when I said, gee, we're scaring people about everything, we ought to put this in perspective. And I read Searching for Safety by Aaron Vildowski, which really opened my brain. and, and tried then to put risks in perspective, and it was tough to get on the air. Two freelance producers quit rather than work on that show. They said, that's not objective, that's conservative dogma to say that regulation itself might hurt people. And fortunately, to ABC's credit, a producer said, we don't agree with you, but this is an argument that deserves to be heard. I put the show on, I wanted to call it, we are scaring you to death, and they wouldn't let me, but uh, the eventual show, Are We Scaring You to Death, with a counterpoint on Nightline where they argued with me, um, got surprisingly good ratings and good reaction from scientists who said, finally, a breath of fresh air telling the truth about some of these issues. That started me on a somewhat independent career of having specials every year. And so I'm very proud of that. That was a scary point where I thought I was finished. And then more recently, we did one called Stupid in America, which is another example of the market in a way that the show should have been called Education, What Works, or something like that. But my boss said, education's boring. No one's going to watch that. We'll call it Stupid in America. And I didn't want to imply that the teachers are stupid, because many are not, and many are heroic in how hard they work, but that the system of sending kids into a government monopoly when they never serve their customers well was stupid. And I worried that the show wouldn't be well re received, because education isn't good TV. It's just people, kids sitting at a desk. But the ratings, we get minute by minute ratings now. They went straight up, and the r was the highest watched show that night, and as was the repeat. And it argued pretty forcefully that choice and competition might make a big difference. And it woke me up to some of the things we discovered in the research, that this argument that w the, the reason it's failing is that we're not spending enough money, we're spending 11 thou per student. If you do the math, that's more than $200,000 per classroom. Think, think what you would do with that money. Drive the kids up with limos, <laughs> give them back massages. Have, hire four doing. excellent like, teachers. Yeah. And it just shows that, that government monopolies waste money. And, and that s stirred the pot some. I'm happy with that show. <laughs> I know one thing that you're, you're proud of is Stossel in the Classroom. What's, what is that, and what do you accomplish through that? I'm very invested in that now. We, we do these shows, and they cost ABC almost half a million bucks. And then they air, and they're gone. And teachers sometimes wrote saying, gee, I wish I taped that because I wanted to show it in class. Or we did tape it, and I showed it in class. And the kids, quiet kids who'd never spoken all year, suddenly they were up arguing. We had a great discussion. Can we get more of these things to use in the classrooms? And I had some shows like Greed that we did, or Is America Number One, which discusses why is America prosperous? And you ask kids, and they say, well, it's because we have democracy, and we have natural resources. And I point out, well, India has democracy and natural resources. India is poor. Well, India is overpopulated. 
Well, actually, the population density of India is the same as that of New Jersey, and New Jersey's doing okay. And Hong Kong has no natural resources, and 20 times per, as many people per square foot. And Hong Kong got rich. In 50 years, it went from third world to first world, because, as Milton Friedman points out, economic freedom. And that's, of course, the answer to why a country's prosperous. The British rulers in Hong Kong enforced rule of law, kept people and property safe, and then they sat around and drank tea. They left people alone. To me, that's such a valuable lesson for kids, and I'm delighted that it's now in half of America's public high schools. Weirdly, more public school teachers are asking for these. And now I have a nonprofit that raises money to buy them from ABC. And so at StossilInTheClassroom.org, any teacher can get these DVDs. The positions you've been taking for years and years and years, some of them, against corporate welfare, against greedy peddlers of junk, junk science ripping people off, in favor of gay rights, free speech, in favor of legalizing prostitution, in favor of legalizing drugs. So there's a lot for conservatives to, to hate about you. And there should be a lot of, for liberals to love about you. And yet, it seems almost always uh, that you're widely adored by conservatives and widely scorned by liberals. Why is that? I'm not sure, but you're absolutely right. And somebody came up to me in New York and said, are you John Stossel? Yes. I hope you die soon. And he was a legal aid lawyer. And there is this real hatred among the left because I'm a consumer reporter defending business, and they just so hate business. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm pro-choice. I was against the war in Iraq. I think homosexuality is just fine. I want drugs legal and prostitution legal, yet conservatives invite me to their conferences and give me standing ovations. Sometimes, not always, but they generally <laughs> like what I have to say, and I even mention some of that. And I, I, it shows how pathetic it is for conservatives in the mainstream media that, that I, a libertarian, are the closest thing that they have to invite to a conference. Uh, and then the liberals being so angry, this hatred of business, and, and I'm not sure what that's about. I used to think it was about envy, that the college professor is angry that his slightly stupid roommate is making more money than he is because he's in business. and. He's a professor of not making as much. But, and and the, the disparity of wealth is a little uncomfortable, or a lot uncomfortable. But then you think about the kings and queens of Europe. Tom Sowles point this out. People didn't hate them for all their wealth, and, and their wealth, proportionately, was vastly greater than now. But they hated the bourgeoisie. They gave them that nasty name. They hated the very people who sold them the things that they needed to make their lives better. So what's that about? And my best guess is that it's the intuitive reaction again that the world is a zero-sum game, that if he makes profit off you, you must have lost something. And if you don't study economics, that is how people think. And I, I see why politicians think that way, because that's how their world works. One wins, somebody else has to lose. But we have a lot of work to do to explain that free commerce doesn't work that way, that everybody gains. Can you talk a little bit about your collaboration with Reason TV, Drew Carey, how it came about? Well, Reason's always meant a lot to me in that when I was lost in the political wilderness and politically naive and it didn't make sense what the conservatives were saying in the magazines I read that they did and the liberals who control the media where I am, what they said, which was always government will fix it and we just have to spend more made no sense. And discovering reason was just wonderful. I could see that, wow, there's another way to think about these things. So I've always read the magazine. Virginia Postrel was my teacher originally. And when you guys started doing television, I thought, great, let's take the best of it and s buy it or steal it. You, you don't mind the competition though? You worried about it? I like the competition. If I were more worried that you would eclipse me, I would still like it because my goal is just to get these ideas out.